Hello and welcome from the First United Methodist Church in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, where it is beginning to look a lot like Advent. Advent begins next week. And one of the things that we do during Advent, we need to start actually before Advent. We have a bell tree at the back of the church in the narthex. And on the bell tree are two different colored bells supporting two different local organizations. Red bells, like this one, have Christmas wishes from local children that have been gathered together from by the Phoenixville Area Community Services. So for instance, it will give, whether it's a boy or a girl, it will give their age, their clothing size, uh, preference of a toy, things that would be useful in determining what a good present or two would be for them. And then if you could, and you'd like to, take a bell, get a present, wrap the presents up, and return them with the bell attached by December 12th, then we can make sure that the elves get them and that they get where they're going on time. So again, the red bells are for the kids through packs. The yellow bells, which are also there, are also uh, one of our projects. The mission committee is inviting us to help provide material support right now or donations, they'd be welcome to, for the clinic, which is a local group that uh, provides medical care for people who are either uninsured or underinsured or who have unsupported medical needs, if they do their best to meet them if they can. And so the bells there have items on them like Imodium, aspirin, children's stickers for when they get a shot, uh, all sorts of things that uh, help a clinic to do a good job, as they do. And those donations can be left in the box behind me, the one with the stripes. Or if you prefer, you can go uh, to sign up for any of these things if you can't get in to pick up a bell uh, at signupgenius.com and look for First United Methodist Church of Phoenixville and Bell Tree Gifts. There's an actual link that I have, but it's so full of numbers and, and, and convoluted things. I think it would be better just to go to signupgenius.com and take it from there. If you're watching us from a different place. I would encourage you to find a similar project in your own town uh, because the need is out there and so is the generosity. Advent <laughs> begins next week and that means we're coming up this week on Thanksgiving. So brace yourselves for that. Save room for pie. And one good way to work up an appetite is to sing loudly wherever you are as we worship. This week as we come together, it's in anticipation of the holiday on Thursday, Thanksgiving. For many people, it's a time of travel. And Psalm 122 was a psalm that was written for people who had traveled to Jerusalem to give thanks to God. We'll read the first four verses responsively. I'll read the parts that are in plain type and ask you to join in, responding with the parts that are in italics. All of us coming into the presence of the Lord. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together. To it, the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord.
gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He hastens and chastens his will to make known the wicked oppressing. Thou cease from distressing, sing praises to his name, he forgets not his own. Beside us to guide us, our God with us joining, ordaining, maintaining his kingdom divine. So from the beginning, the fight we were winning, the Lord was at our side, all oh, glory be thine. Tell thee the leader triumphant, and pray that the still defender wilt be. Let thy congregation escape tribulation, thy name be ever praised, O Lord, make us free. This week, our scripture comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, through chapter 12, verse 2. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, and in caves and holes in the ground, Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better, so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God.
1983, the day before Thanksgiving, three of us from my hometown were meeting up in Boston to drive home for Thanksgiving. There was John that I'd graduated with, and he was studying over at MIT, and Chip was a grad student at Boston where I was an undergrad. And Chip had a car, which meant that it would be easier and a little bit more pleasant and a little bit cheaper for three people to all chip in on the gas and the tolls and ride home together than it would be to take the Greyhound or the train. And so we loaded up on Doritos and Pepsi and we met in Kenmore Square and Chip pulled up and he had this white Chevy, I think it was a Chevy. I remember it was white and it had a red interior and it was kind of beat up. But we threw our bags in, we climbed in, we headed out the Mass Pike and we were getting close to the Connecticut border, probably somewhere around um, oh, 10 or so in the morning. And John asked Chip if he wouldn't mind turning on the radio. And that's when Chip explained that his car, which obviously had some issues, uh, had a radio that didn't actually work. But his tape deck, for some reason, did. And so he took out a cassette and jammed it into the tape deck, and he started playing uh, Motown's Greatest Hits. We drove along, side A finished, Chip flipped it out and turned it over, side B started, and then side B eventually finished. And that's when we realized there was only one cassette in the entire car. But he flipped it over to side A and started again. And then side B. Somewhere around Hartford, we stopped for lunch, but McDonald's didn't sell music. So back into the car, side B finished, side A again. Now by this time, tears of a clown was being burned into my brain. Ain't no mountain high enough was no longer my friend and I was losing all R-E-S-P-E-C-T for the tunes long before we started the approach to the Tappan Zee Bridge and found ourselves in a 20 or 30 mile traffic jam on the busiest travel day of the entire year. At one of the biggest bottlenecks in the whole Northeast Corridor. That was when the gas gauge decided it was going to dip. Now, you know, how, when that happens, you begin to debate with yourself whether it will be better to get off the highway now and fill up, or whether you want to make it through the, through the mess you're in and trust that eventually there will be enough fuel to get you through to where you can move again. And then when you do decide that no, that second option would probably be the wrong one, you realize that you are now in the wrong lane to get off the highway, and nobody in the right lane is going to let you get over because nobody in the left lane was willing to let them on at the last on-ramp. 
And so you're looking around nervously, wondering what's going to happen. And all the while, Martha and the Vandellas are advising somebody else, Jimmy, Jimmy Mac, you better hurry back. Uh, what a trip. What a trip. But we did make it home. And predictably, on Black Friday, I didn't care how crowded the Springfield Mall was. I got myself to Sam Goody's and I bought Billy Joel's latest release and the Berlin Philharmonic's recording of Brahms' first symphony because I was not going to let that happen again. Now, the strange thing, looking back, is I don't recall that any of us ever thought that that trip itself wasn't worthwhile. I am sure that not one of us even considered the idea that trapped there on 95 between tractor trailers and Volkswagens, trying to thread the needle at a toll booth that we could just turn around, go back. That we could just say, oh well, we tried. We kept going. We kept going because Thanksgiving Day, even an unremarkable Thanksgiving Day, was important enough to go on. And we were going to see our families and they were going to see us and it's just what you do. You get together with the people you know on Thanksgiving. Even if sometimes you're at one house for a meal and another house for dessert, somehow you make things work. You keep on going. You don't even question it. And somehow, the trip itself, as miserable as that particular one was, made its way into being part of the holiday. Even to the point where by now, well, long before now, but, but even now, that ride is less excruciating than it is laughable. Which brings me to the point of this sermon. Our lives, like that crazy road trip, have a destination. A destination that changes everything that goes before it that puts it all into a different light and makes it more than just one annoyance and problem after another and turns it into, well, it turns it into something good. And, and one way or another, even joyful. The Bible points out our final destination on, on the trip we call living and says that our destination is to be with God. Heaven is not a place like a Thanksgiving table is a place. It's a state of being. It's being with the Lord. But because we are who we are and we're not there yet, we still think of things as place. And it helps us to, to understand it. And so does the idea of a celebration and a meal. The purpose of life is to be with God. And God makes it possible God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life, might be with God. 
For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. And when that happens, when that happens, the Bible describes that kind of life in in terms of a feast, in terms of a holiday, in terms of a huge banquet, a, a wedding, wedding reception, puts all of those things out there because those are happy occasions. Those are times when we come together as people. And it talks about that state of being with God, that celebration, that feast, that banquet, like some great Thanksgiving day, one where nobody gets into any arguments across the table, one where nobody ever forgets the punchline to the joke they were telling, the kind of celebration where the mashed potatoes are always hot and the gravy is never lumpy and nobody ever has to do the dishes. And in a very real sense, the struggles that we go through now, the problems of the trip, great and small, they all become part of the joy that is around that table. And there at the table may even be some of those obstacles with us people who might have been unable to stand each other, people who would see one another in a room and walk out, may in God's presence sit elbow to elbow and laugh. People who may have counted one another enemies, both of them all of them reconciled by a mutual recognition that their sins have been wiped away by Christ and that they are at peace with God and at peace with themselves and that somehow that means they are at peace with one another. And so they're at that table, they're at that destination, they're in the celebration. At one end is the prodigal son that Jesus talked about going out and wasting his life and throwing away everything that had been given him. And at the other end, the elder brother who had stayed and taken care of things and did what he was supposed to do, but found himself resenting everything that his younger brother was doing. The two of them that just never could make terms together at the father's table. And both happy to be there, and both happy to see the other. Both at home. At this season, at least in this country, we tell a story about a, a small group of believers who followed their conscience across the North Atlantic. Naive, blundering Europeans who had absolutely no conception of what a North American winter would look like. Part of a group that would not survive half of them until springtime. People who were ignorant of the skills that they would need simply to survive where they landed which, by the way, was even hundreds of miles off course from the place they had started to find. People we call pilgrims. People who had no business being where they were. And in our traditional iconography, sitting down with them are the people that saved their lives and yes, people they would eventually turn on, but who initially welcomed them. And that picture, before it 
things went bad, but that picture of people sitting and sharing what they had. That's a picture of the kingdom of God. We call these folks pilgrims. And we're not at all unlike them. Pilgrims are people that are on a journey. And they may not even know what they're doing. They may blunder along. They may act on instinct and have very bad instincts to act on. They may be like a bunch of late adolescents, early young adults, piling into a car and not really understanding or having put much thought into it. But still going and moving. On a road trip, hey, you can't stop that. We're all pilgrims, one way or another. And sometimes if we're smart, we'll, we'll look around us and we'll, we'll ask, do you know where you're going to? Do you like the things that life is showing you? Do, where are you going to? Do you know? We're all travelers. Heading home to God. Pilgrims who absolutely all face unexpected obstacles and things that we never even gave a single thought to throughout our whole life. Finding most of our problems are our own fault, our own sins, but also finding ourselves helped along by the grace of God sometimes directly through the Holy Spirit, sometimes helped along by other travelers we meet along the way. And throughout life, those situations that we meet and those things that we go through form us and shape us and teach us if we're smart enough to learn, we have all been in, we all will be in spots that we wouldn't wish on anybody else. But those spots may be from the eventual vantage point of heaven, our finest hours, or to be a little less dramatic about it, Maybe they'll just be kind of funny when you look back on them. Now, I'm not saying that they'll always turn out to lead to dancing in the streets. But they do teach us that when we meet God face to face, we'll know enough to say how sweet it is to be loved by you. There are lots of examples that can be found in anybody's life. And certainly the Bible offers example after example after example. And I'm not going to drag this sermon out by throwing them all at you at one time. For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith, conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign enemies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking, flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. 
They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. And let us run with perseverance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. I invite you to join me in prayer. If life is a journey, God, we are grateful for our fellow travelers and grateful for each other's help and company. If life is a journey, God, we are grateful both for familiar sights and for discoveries that each day holds. And yet, Along the way, there are spots where the path turns to mud or we lose our way, when we grow tired, when it gets dark and cold. So, Lord, we pray for everyone who is troubled and everyone who is weary or ready to give up. Renew the joy of the journey, Lord which leads us in the end to you. Amen. Now 
thank we O our God with hearts and hands and voices who wondrous things has done in whom this world rejoices who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. Oh, may this bounteous God through all our lives be With ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us and keep us still in grace and guide us when perplexed and free us from all ills in this world and the next. All, all praise and thanks to God the Father now be given, the Son and Him who reigns with them in highest heaven. The one eternal God, whom earth and heaven adore, for thus it was, is now, and shall be evermore. May the peace of God, that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Christ Jesus our Lord, and the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen.